Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know some of you here, and uh, one of you, I think, is a former student of mine. So it's quite scary. Um, it makes me realize how old I am. And um, some of you have also listened to this talk before. Um, so pretend that um, you, know, you haven't, and just laugh occasionally. So this is a disclaimer. Um, don't expect to be happy after this talk. I'm serious about it. Um, some of you will become miserable realizing you are in the wrong profession. Um, so expecting to know everything about this talk on, ha on happiness in an hour is just too much work for me. Um, so take whatever is relevant. You know, if it's not relevant, just throw it away. I'm not talking about dogma or religion. It's, it's actually quite empirical, our approach on happiness. Um, and again, if you've attended this talk, feel free to Facebook. Um, so it's all right, I won't mind. I'm used to students falling asleep or you think they're writing notes, they're not. <laughs> they're online chatting to each other, so I'm, I'm quite thick about that now. Um, so let's talk about something serious. So why are you in this session? I'm in this session because Ian Powell emailed me, so I got scared. Um, so I have to uh, show up. Um, so why are you in this session? Is it because you're, you know, if you don't show up, someone will not be happy, or you, you're here because you want to have a break from your um, very slow, boring jobs as doctors? Um, and asking yourself, you know, why are you married? You know, I'm, I'm partnered, and I'm partnered because I thought I'll be happy with my partner. I, I am still happy with my partner. <laughs> Um, I'm sure some of you are also thinking, why did I get married? Um, and why are we doctors? Um, I mean, seriously, I thought, uh, and I still believe, medicine will make me happy or will contribute to my happiness. Um, but it's also contributed to a lot of stress and misery. Um, the reason I'm asking these questions um, is because the motivation for us doing things it's mainly because we just want to be happy. So why did I wear this shirt today? It's one of my favorite shirts. Uh, it makes me look thin a bit. Uh, <laughs> also makes me look a little young. Um, I hang out with students, um, and hanging out with students make me feel energized. Why did I, you know, I talk about my shoes. Why do I buy Echo shoes? They're the dumpiest, boring-looking shoes. But at my age, you want something comfortable <laughs> and pain-free. So essentially what I'm saying here is we do things from the most menial things to the most, probably, most serious decisions ever. We make our choices because we just want to be happy. Um, or we just want to feel good or avoid pain and suffering. And it's a motivation actually for, you, know, you can be the most brilliant scientist or doctor, or you can be a street sweeper. We have the same motivations. Um, so message number one, so a few messages here, is that all of us, all of us just want to be happy. And, and if some of you are into s and <laughs> it's because you think pain will bring you happiness. <laughs> Serious. And not just humans, animals are the same, particularly animals with highly developed um, neural systems just want to feel good and avoid pain and suffering. Even earthworms, I mean, they have a very primitive um, neural system, but you know, if you poke an earthworm, which I used, no, I'm not me, I'm not a sociopath. <laughs> when I was, no, seriously, when I was a kid, I would play with them and my mom was, would hate me for it. Um, not because, she, no, it's because she considers earthworms as dirty, but, I would play with them, and I actually was horrible. And they, would, they wouldn't approach me. They'll actually scoot away. It's the same thing. They just want to experience happiness. Not probably happiness, but be, be free from this monster. Yeah? So um, talking about happiness, uh, let's talk about medical students. Um, medical students, I'm sure you guys know, in New Zealand are a very privileged group. Uh, highly competitive, they tend to be top of their classes, they play music, they play rugby, they're good in art, they speak five languages, they get into med school. And my experience in med school is that most of them, well not most, some are pretty happy, 
but a lot are very miserable. Um, so I deal with that a lot. I tend to be a mentor slash pastor for a lot of our med students. So we've done a few studies. So this is just one of them, um, looking at medical students and mostly medical students in this study. About 6% or so have actual or active suicidal thoughts. Um, depression rates, anxiety rates, not news anymore, but actual suicidal thoughts. It's actually similar to the uh, university students, rest of the University of Auckland students. We sampled about more than 1,000. Um, and then we looked at high school students, about 1,400 of them in the North Island. Similar rates. Okay, a lot, of, a lot of unhappiness. So what I'm saying here is, even though all of us want to be happy, for many of us, it's just an aspiration. In reality, there's so much unhappiness, so much dissatisfaction, and our profession is not protected. In fact, so I think sometimes our, our profession contributes to a lot of unhappiness out there. Um, the good news, so it's not all about we're doomed. Uh, the good, there's good news. Good news is there's a few things happening in psychology and in neuroscience. So, one is the area of positive psychology, which I'm involved with. Um, positive psychology has been going on for about um, 20 or so years. Um, started in the University of Pennsylvania but by Marty Seligman. It's interesting history because Marty Seligman, I'm not sure if you're aware, but from the for the, some of the psychiatrists here, you would know Marty Seligman as a big contributor to cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, Aaron Beck is the father of cognitive behavioral therapy. Marty Seligman's a colleague, and um, they're both from Penn. And uh, Marty Seligman, after a few years of studying depression, um, looking at suicide and anxiety and neurosis, made the decision in the 70s, I think. He said, I'm sick of studying depression and neurosis. I'll study happiness. And I'm sure you know the, the, the response of the acad, you know, ac academia in psychology and psychiatry. It's like, are you crazy, Marty? Why will you study happiness? It's too fluffy. It's non-scientific. And that was the uh, prevailing tone then. Um, but for, af after a couple, uh, couple of decades, you know, Marty Seligman is now one of the most popular sought-after academicians in terms of research as well as talks because what he's studying and the whole field of positive psychology is what makes people genuinely happy. I'm not talking about happy, giggly, and superficial. I'm talking about people who are just solidly happy, equanimous, just content. So that's the whole area of positive psychology. And um, there's a few of us actually looking at positive psychology now. And one of our, there's, you, you have, we have a colleague also in the room um, who's studying positive psychology doing her PhD. Um, I'm doing my PhD in compassion, which is linked to positive psychology. So it's actually becoming a very interesting topic. You know, why, what causes happiness or what's highly linked to happiness? And then from a, um, as a psychiatrist, what also interests me is this whole area of affective neuroscience, which is relatively new, also about 20 years old. And it's uh, neuroscience focusing on affect or emotion, contentment, craving. I just came from a big effective neuroscience conference in Boston, um, and our key spe keynote speaker is the Dalai Lama, um, because he's a big funder of effective neuroscience research. It's interesting, he's a Buddhist monk, but he cares about people's happiness, so he throws a lot of uh, money, research money, into this area. So effective neuroscience is looking at the physical and neurological basis for emotions, happiness, sorrow, craving, a lot of basic states. So um, I'll talk about myself. I'm a little on the narcissistic side, and I'll ask you as well. I, I don't have time to ask all of you what makes you happy, but I'll, you know, when I ask myself, what makes me happy? All sorts of things. Wellington, coming to Wellington actually makes me happy. Uh, I, I like Wellington. It's beautiful until I get hit by the wind. I almost <laughs> fell over, <laughs> like, wow. I love Wellington, but sometimes it's a little windy. Um, feeling secure, feeling loved, and feeling accepted when people or students laugh at my jokes, even though they, you know, they're laughing because you know, I'll give them the mark. I'm aware of that, too. Um, that, that makes me feel a little happy. 
You know, when you're cuddling someone, you're supposed to cuddle while watching, you know, <laughs> while watching The Block. I don't know if that's popular the rest of uh, New Zealand, but in Auckland, uh, I lived a few blocks from The Block, so um, that was fun. Um, but cuddling someone you should not be cuddling is also a different type of happiness. <laughs> that's, a, that's a dopamine spike happiness, similar to, similar to cocaine. Um, all Blacks winning. Team New Zealand almost winning, you know, it's exciting. Um, when I get my paycheck every couple of weeks, you know, I look, look at it in my bank account and have a little blip of, ooh, came in. And then a um, few hours later, or, you know, it just goes away again, payments, um, all sorts of things. Food, I'm a foodie Filipino, so Filipino equals food. Um, I love eating, all sorts of things. I'm a musician, so I love Bach, cello sweets, just makes me go crazy. Um, one thing I all, also do, which some of my colleagues say I should not do, is I actually hang out with homeless people once in a while, particularly in Auckland or in my suburb. I talk to them and I buy them supermarket food. And I, you know, I can remember the last guy was earlier this week, and I asked him, so what, you know, could, can I buy you something from a supermarket? And he said, um, get me a chicken. <laughs> said, a whole chicken? <laughs> because it's not within my budget. I was thinking of about, you know, five bucks of loaf. And he said, a chicken. So I got him chicken, but I also got him bread. I get, got him, a, you know, an, a chocolate bar and a diet drink. <laughs> and it just, I just can still see his face. And probably he's wondering, are you about to convert me or something? Because I've had people ask me that. So which church do you belong to? So I said, no, no, no. no. I won't give you a card, but and remembering those faces, they're priceless. So you might think, you know, the question of the, the theme, theme of happiness, like all sorts of things can make us happy. And when I ask you, and this is just a hypothetical thing, let's, let's say we, we have a study going on now, and I have a, uh, a few med students who are good in statistics. I'll ask you, write three things that make you happy, and then we'll tabulate them and probably there will be three times, how many people are here? About a couple of hundred. Mm. Yep, let's say we'll have three times 200, it's about 600 responses. My feeling is we can actually reduce those 600 responses into three, okay? Into three, three themes. Um, and these are what I call, and some people call the circuitries for happiness, that there are actually generally just three types. I mean, it's not strictly, Three, but these are the general themes. Number one is when we feel calm, when we feel contented. So it's a different type of happiness. The second type of happiness is when we get excited, when we, there's a drive, there's a goal, there's pleasure, a lot of the sensual stuff come into this department. And then the third thing is probably one of the reasons why we're in medicine. You know, it's, we know that when we connect, we know that when we help, when we know that when there's then, when, then we're of meaning to other people. It actually makes us feel good. So let's talk about this one at a time. And by the way, do we can I can distribute the slides to people who want it. Though. Love yep, it. yep. So in, for, for the neurotic note takers out there, uh, <laughs> and I'm one of them. And nowadays, you, you, you know the neuro neurotic ones. Instead of a pen, they have a camera. <laughs> and even if you tell them no photos, copyright that they'll do it discreetly <laughs> or they'll re record things on the iPhone. I, I do that too. So, <laughs> so let's talk about this one at a time. So the first time, the first one is feeling calm and contented. So that's a picture of the, my, my cat actually looks like this cat. He's a ginger. Um, so that's an anxious cat. You know, when, when, when we're not calm, when we're, when we're always thinking something's missing, um, it's actually very hard to be happy because you're on a threatened state. Okay, so it's very important to actually learn to be calm. If you're the neurotic type, and many doctors are, it's hard to be happy. And a lot of us resort to exogenous things like alcohol, dope. Uh, who are dope smokers here? <laughs> oh, laughing. I, I've seen some of you uh, earlier on the corner in Lambton Key. Um, so calm, let's talk about the calm and contentment circuitry. I think feeling calm, like what I said, feeling calm, feeling content is Crucial for happiness. Crucial. Um, the neurotransmitters involved in this, we simplified it as you know, the GABA circuitry, serotonin, 
um, endogenous opioids. And we also have exogenous substances that can bring us, you know, this type of calm and contentment if needed. People you drink alcohol, THC, benzodiazepines, SSRIs can, can also help with this. But the good news is, you know, there are substances out there, but we can actually learn techniques, proven techniques on achieving calm. Uh, mind training techniques, and that we can actually reset our overall level. So that's the nice thing about positive psychology, is that this is being documented now that, you know, if you're quite neurotic, you can be less neurotic. But don't expect to be, you know, perpetually happy. That's stupid. To, uh, to, to, to have a goal of I'll be perpetually happy is, you know, it's non-functional. There will be times that you, you have to be anxious once in a while. You know, if someone's dying in front of you, you just can't be calm. You have, the, the, the anxiety circuitry has to kick in once in a while. But for many of us, it's constantly on. Yep. Um, now, well, there's a saying, I, I, forgot, I actually forgot who said this, but he said, happiness is actually one thing what you have. It's actually an, a nice saying. It's it, it just learning how to be content. Um, so that's quickly uh, the calm contentment circuitry. And then the, this is the, the, the fun circuitry, it's excitement, pleasure circuitry. So watching sports or playing sports or win, you know, your team winning makes us really excited and happy. It's a different type of happiness. So people who are into shoes uh, usually uh, no, I'm making a sexist comment. A lot of women like shoes. I can say that my mom is into shoes. She's 86, and every time we go away, um, we go, you know, we go shopping or we, we travel. She ends up in a shoe shop, and you know, I end up, you know, buying something for my mom. And I'll ask her, "How many shoes have you?" Don't ask that, you know, because it's a, the process of acquiring is excite. It's actually exciting, but there's something to do with shoes. And money is the same. Money gives us a certain degree of happiness, or just knowing that you will make money is exciting in its own. Um, I'm Filipino, so we love roast pork, um, particularly the one with crispy skin. So if I imagine roast pork with crispy skin, I get e really excited. In fact, last night we were already planning when we're going to have it with some of my Chinese friends. And then you know, the last thing here is about you know, um, conjugal activities, or it doesn't have to be conjugal, it can be uh, yeah, solo. Um, <laughs> serious, you know, we're doctors, we know this thing. So um, sex is exciting. Um, it's fun, but it's interesting, there's all sorts of, you might think they're all very different, but the interesting thing, we're not that complex really as, as animals. The same circuitry is actually stimulated. You know, this is the pleasure circuitry. The main neurotransmitter involved is dopamine. Um, I won't talk about the Vita A projections that will make you sleep, but that's a, a picture of a dopamine molecule. When you, when you stimulate the circuitry for excitement, for let's say sensual stuff, a dopamine's getting kicked in. You know, it makes you feel excited, makes you powerful, makes you feel motivated. The problem with relying on dopamine type happiness is it's very temporary. It's uh, unsustainable, it doesn't last. And the same reason why gamblers, you know, just get addicted. Uh, they want the next hit. They want the next hit. And the problem is you get tolerant and you want more. So it's an it's a important circuitry. It makes us feel excited. But if you rely on it, I'm, unfortunately, it's not going to last. And it's, 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 it's going to cause a lot of damage. So there's a picture of one of the most famous Filipino, um, unfortunately, is Imelda Marcos. I mean, she's still alive. I don't want to say fortunately or unfortunately, but... Um, she's in her 80s, close to 90s, I think, and she's still acquiring power even up to now in the Philippines. Um, she is, I think she will try to sue the Philippine government because she wants her impressionist pieces back. But, you know, these are paintings which, you know, she bought using the government's money. But anyway, never-ending desire for stuff. And you know she had 3,000 shoes, but that was in the 70s. I don't know how many she has now. Um, same with cocaine users. So from email, I'm talking about cocaine users. <laughs> Nothing different. You want the next hit. Um, so, and you might think, oh, they're different. It's very similar to a lot of us. We're going for the next achievement, for the next rank. 
I'm not saying the circuitry is pathologic, but be careful if you rely on your happiness, if your happiness is mainly on excitement. And unfortunately, in the West, there's so much emphasis on this as a type, as a source of happiness, even from primary school, from high school. It's about achievement. It's about being top. Like in America, you have to be the best. You can't be the best all the time. There's like 380 million of you. You can't be top all the time, but that's the emphasis. Um, in fact, some universities in the U.S. are having problems in terms of giving out marks to students because a lot of students, if they don't get the top marks, they sue the school. So it's, a, it's a very different type of happiness, this excitement circuitry. So this is, for me, the, the most interesting type of circuitry of happiness. This is connection, our, 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 our desire to connect with other people is actually one of the deepest I think, and one of the highest sources of happiness. So who among you, when you see those three uh, apes hugging together, make you feel warm? None? No, anyway. A lot of us do. For, for some of you who just th see it as a picture, that's a problem. <laughs> uh, either you're sleepy, which is all right. You know, this is a graveyard shift in terms of lectures. Um, <laughs> but, or you might be missing some interesting uh, cells called mirror neurons, but anyway. Um, so connection, compassion, circuitry, a lot of people say it's one of the highest forms of happiness. Um, and it's generally sustainable. When I say sustainable, even just, uh, I, I talked about that homeless guy out of, outside of Countdown in Point Chev. Just thinking of him now, I think I spent probably about, I don't know, about nine to, 12, nine to 11 dollars on, of stuff. But just thinking about it now makes me feel good. I don't think I made a huge impact on his life. <laughs> he made a big impact on my life. And just because I feel that at least probably for half an hour or so, I made someone's life a little better. Um, so just thinking about it, reflecting on things, like even our patients, patients that we've helped, how many of us think about that? <laughs> Just thinking about cases or patients and families who would help, like thinking of my case, my, my patients and people I've helped, I feel good. Um, so it's sustainable, it's internally reignited. Just thinking about you know, how we can actually help or how we have helped. And talking about the circuitry of compassion and connection and empathy, this whole altruistic circuitry, it's actually incredibly fascinating. Um, a lot of us think that it is genetically wired, the need to connect, the urge to help. In fact, we call this the altruistic impulse, which is much deeper than the, in the intellectual circuitry. When I say that, when, for example, if I'm walking down, you know, walking, walking up here and then I collapse, I mean, with a group of doctors, many of you, without even thinking about it, will just rush. Okay. Even if I tell you I have Ebola, you will still <laughs> rush. <laughs> because the cognitive part isn't kicking in yet, but the impulse to help is firing. And then after a while you realize Ebola, and that's the cognitive circuit stops you. Ah, uh, you know, call, you know, the hospital. Um, but it is wired, we are wired. Um, and it's the highest form of happiness, a lot of us say that, but feeling disconnected is also one of the most depressing situation any human being can experience. Um, in fact, I'll quote the Dalai Lama a few times just because his, uh, his book has shaped my thinking. Um, his books, um, he, he said a few times in meetings that you can be the wealthiest, you can be the most successful person out there owning you know, the top skyscraper in New York City, uh, the nicest penthouse, but if you're disconnected, all you will look for is an open window from which to jump from. Because connection is essential for our existence as social creatures. I'm not talking about religious things here, because we're social creatures. Um, message number one, again, all of us want to be happy. Number two, 
is that even though we all want to be happy, there are actually traps in our search for happiness. So um, our brain is actually not optimized for happiness. Our brain is optimized for survival. And because of the drive to survive, it actually can cause problems in our search for happiness. So this is a, a quick list of different traps. Uh, we don't have time to go over this, but a, a common trap, uh, which a lot of doctors are not really, uh, we don't have problems with this, is a focus on rank, <laughs> um, the focus on appearance or possessions as sources of happiness. Um, it's, an, it's an obvious trap because it's not sustainable. You can never be all on top of everyone all the time. Um, in terms of appearance, we're aging every second. <laughs> for the plastic surgeons out there, it's good for business, but uh, in reality, that's, that's true. You know, we're aging. Every time I see my medical students, like, oh my God, you know, they're getting younger and younger. They're actually not getting younger and younger. I'm getting older and older, and it's just the gap just fits <laughs> farther and farther. Um, and then focusing on possessions as sources of happiness, they're just a dopamine spike, which will, and they will get scratched. So I, uh, I, I upgraded my car a few months ago, really excited. Oh, it's nice. It looks like a spaceship inside, uh, like nice lights, and you know, I can talk to it. It talks back, you know. It's like, after a month, I ignore it. You know, after it got, an, it, it, it got a scratch, and I was so disappointed. Oh my God, the scratch. And now there are a couple of scratches, like, well, just a car. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a tricky one to rely on these things. Um, another trap is looking at money as a source of happiness. Mo I'm interesting work on money. Money is important for happiness, but only to a certain extent only to a certain extent. And they've done multiple studies on this in the States um, that uh, we only need a certain amount beyond which more money will not bring more happiness. And apparently the value is somewhere around, I think 60 to 80,000 US dollars uh, income for a family of four in the US. So translate that to New Zealand. So a lot of us here uh, who are medical professionals will be earning much more than that. Um, and I'm sure you also know um, that even more money, it just brings us more comfort or more options, but not necessarily more happiness. We already have experienced that. Um, so relying on money solely as a source of happiness is, is a trap. And another interesting trap is habituation. Essentially that means we habituate to things. We habituate to good things, we habituate to bad things. You habituate to your partner after, you know, after you've done the whole courtship thing, which by the way is not apparently a term anymore. Kids don't court each other anymore. <laughs> they just meet and sleep and they're together and there's no process anyway. Um, so it's a different, so when you ask you know, students, do you, so how did you court her? They look at me like, court? <laughs> but anyway, let's say you've, you, know, you have this new partner. After a while, you start ignoring. After a while, you start wondering, oh, you know, I, I, I wish I'll be with someone else. And then that partner moves on, and then you realize, oh, sheesh, you know. Or even with kids. You know, how many of you have kids? You're excited, oh, lots of pictures. And after a while, you're thinking, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> Send her to a boarding school or something like that. <laughs> And then when she moves to a boarding school, oh my God, you know, there's a good school in the neighborhood. And it's habituation. We get used to things, and then when we lose them, we go, you know, we go nuts. How many of us are habituated to our profession? I actually don't want to call it a profession. It's a vocation. How many of us, I remember, you know, applying for a med school in the Philippines. I come from a, you know, not a wealthy family. We were not super poor, but we weren't rich. And we can, my family can only afford the state school it's called the University of the Philippines. And if I didn't get in there, I won't be a doctor. But I, luckily I got in and I was so happy. I felt like I won the lotto for a couple of weeks. <laughs> 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 then you realize, I'm sure you've realized this, you realize after a couple of weeks in med school, you're not smart anymore. <laughs> you're pretty average, <laughs> even below average. Um, and then, and then you graduate, then you, we forget 
all the trouble we, you know, we, we experienced to get to where we are. How many of us actually think of the many other people who so wanted to become doctors and cannot? And I see this all the time at the med school because I also deal with those who are applying for med school. It's cutthroat in Auckland and I'm sure in Otago's as well. And I actually think if I apply now, I don't think I'll get in because I don't play rugby or crick. I, all I can say there is just I'm smart and I also play music. That's not enough anymore. You have to do all sorts of things. So um, we habituate, and it's a, it's, a, it's a trap for happiness. A very big trap is emotions. Okay, we, we often think, particularly doctors, we often think we are very rational creatures. We're not. In fact, our emotions hijack our prefrontal cortex. Our emotions hijack our intelligence quickly, even without us knowing it. We're more emotional than rational. So, and the problem is, um, even though emotions are so powerful, and you know, emotions are so powerful that you decide to marry someone for the rest of your life. How crazy is that? <laughs> You know, emotions. You know, emotions are the reason for all the, I mean, if you ask me, all the problems, most of the problems in the world, including, you know, ISIS and everything's actually due to emotions. Um, we're very emotional. And the problem is, even though we're very emotional, we never learn much about emotions. We don't talk about that. Emotions, no, we're, we're, no, we're that's, that's not what we talk about. We're, we're smart people. How many of us in school, in medical school, or even in, I'm a psychiatrist, I have to say, we didn't get lectures or workshops on emotions, normal emotions. Why do we have emotions? We learn so much about science, which is good, maths, languages, arts, sports. But I think knowing a lot about emotions, because that's how we communicate, that's, it determines a lot about our happiness scores, I think it's crucial. So just a very basic description of, uh, you know, a, a short couple of slides on emotions. We, in emotions research, and I'm learning much about emotions now, not because of my, but being a psychiatrist, but because I'm doing my PhD on compassion and empathy, and my supervisor is an emotions scientist. All he does is study emotions. In fact, his specialty, so I'm digressing a bit, his specialty is the emotion of disgust. That's his special, he's the world's number two specialist on disgust, but anyway, so he's my supervisor. <laughs> Probably that's why he wanted me, because uh, I'm so bad in statistics that I think every time he sees me, he has this feeling of disgust. But, but anyway, um, a couple of basic stuff on emotion is that we can, gener we can divide emotions into two things, so pos two, two groups, positive emotions, negative emotions, a very basic um, taxonomy of emotions. So positive emotions, feeling of joy, happiness, being feeling grateful, feeling in awe, feeling loved. That's, those are positive emotional states. In negative emotional states, obvious, uh, being angry, being scared, being fearful, embarrassed, disgust is actually in the negative realm. Um, they're, in the, they're what you call negative emotions. The bad news is negative emotions trump positive emotions. They're very powerful. When we experience negative emotions, it will hijack our whole sense of being, and it lasts for a long time. Long time. Uh, I've talked about this a few times when I remember the first time as, as a new academic at the department, um, more than 10 years ago, I presented the new curriculum to a big group of psychiatrists and everyone, 59 of them out of 60, were saying, good, great, clapping. I don't think of those 59. I think of that one senior doctor who told me, Tony, it's rubbish. For 10 years, until I killed him. No, just joking. <laughs> No, 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 I'm, I'm, that's why I'm doing my PhD on compassion. <laughs> I have to work through these things. Uh, no, I, we're sort of friends now. <laughs> because he asked me to give a lecture. 
he asked me, said, Tony, can you do a, a talk on, I'm a sleep specialist. Can you do a talk on sleep in my specialty group? I said, oh, are you serious? You want me? I thought I'm rubbish. Uh, no, actually, I, I approached him later and, and asked him, do you remember 10 years ago, June, Monday, <laughs> 12.44, and you're still wearing the same shoes, and you have less hair. Um, and then he said, no. He actually does not remember. Um, but that's what negative emotions are. And, and it's possible he actually didn't say it's rubbish. Probably it's just my mind, you know? Probably, I don't know what he said. <laughs> um, but negative emotions are just so powerful, and they leave a powerful mark, and we ruminate. Same thing, you know, if you remember what Peter was saying earlier, how many of us will remember the Miriams, those who died, all our failures, but will actually rarely think about the people we help. It's just the state of our mind. That's, it's not being bad or evil. It's because, apparently, the mind does that because it's protective. So it's for survival. We need to prepare for future negative events. We have to be aware, okay? But, um, the, so the problem with this type of circuitry is that we're actually a sponge for negativity. We have to remember that um, because it can affect a lot of our emotional state. Uh, this, the, yeah. So the, the part of the brain that's involved in planning, reflection, which is important, is also the same part of the brain that causes a lot of these ruminations. Our circuitry responsible for craving, for desiring things, again, very important for survival. Surv uh, craving for water, food, shelter, is also the same circuitry that makes us obsess and ruminate about things that we think we need. Um, make us, you know, quite lo always looking for th other things or a glass is half empty. Um, so message number two is that there are traps within our brain, they're actually in our brain, in our search for happiness. And like what I mentioned earlier, our circuitry, I think, is actually optimized for survival, but not necessarily for, for happiness. So, so it's not all doom and gloom. That's why we have you know, positive psychology and affective neuroscience guiding, I think, the whole thing, is that message number three, and lots of fancy studies on this, is that the brain is neuroplastic. It can be reshaped. Yeah, it, we can retrain it to deal with these traps. Um, and um, these are different interventions. A lot of these interventions have been discussed by Peter, actually. But I'll just go over some of the, the top four, my, my, my favorite four, um, has, that, has, that have been, sh this, these are uh, interventions that have been shown to be quite helpful in terms of uh, positive emotions as well as overall sense of happiness. So we'll talk about mindfulness briefly, developing an attitude of gratitude, developing a higher level of compassion. You might think you're already compassionate. I'm telling you, you can train yourself to be better at it. And then one area which I think a lot of us suffer from, doctors are notorious and nurses, is many of us actually have very low self-compassion. And we'll talk about that as well, how we can actually address that. And as you can see from the list, there's a few other things here um, that have been shown to assist in terms of increasing overall sense of happiness. So the first one is mindfulness. Uh, I'm not sure how many, how many of you have done a little bit of mindfulness exercise? Wow, this is an enlightened group. Yeah, it's a union. <laughs> yeah, um, that's pretty good. So um, what's mindfulness? So mindfulness, what, what it does, uh, it act, again, Peter mentioned this, you know, developing that wisdom in, within us, but what mindfulness does, if, you're in a, if we're in a mindful state, is that it allows us to see what's going on inside our head. Okay, what do we see? <laughs> Normally, what we see is that our mind is constantly wandering. It's constantly wandering, easily distracted, we're easily uh, reactive to things, you know, you might be feeling okay, and then you get uh, uh, you know, a, a letter of complaint from a patient or a family, and then suddenly you're just, oh my God, you're a mess. And then it's hard for you to recover. So very reactive, we can sweat the small stuff. I'm not saying that complaints are small stuff, that's big stuff for us. 
um, I, I call this the limbic hijack of the prefrontal cortex. You know, when negative things happen, the limbic system, the emotional part, just hijacks the smart part. And for many of us, it, you know, the hijack takes a long time. The more resilient can easily move back into being balanced. Um, and the mind, as mentioned earlier, is very prone to negativity. In fact, they've identified in neuroscience this, um, this network called the default mind network. They've identified the parts and the circuitry. It's just too fancy for me to remember. But there's this DMN, d default mind network, that's generally switched on for most of us if we're not doing something conscious. And it's a state of mind where we're constantly wondering, um, mind jumping from one topic to another, and it's highly correlated to feeling unhappy. So a lot of us live too much in our head. Um, so what, what does mindfulness do when you practice mindfulness? And mindfulness is not as simple as just doing a meditation course and then that's it. Mindfulness is actually being able to switch in a mindful state even though you're not formally meditating. So it can be even in, in front of our patients. If you're doing procedures, it's easier actually to switch on a mindful state. But what's mindfulness? So mindfulness is generally defined as continuous awareness of the present moment. You develop the mind's eye or that wisdom. Um, you just accept things as they are. Reality is, you know, there will be negative things happening in our life. We cannot control everything. It makes us actually quite emotionally fit. Uh, the problem with mindfulness is you can understand it, but without practice, it's not going to happen. Nothing different. I've been in New Zealand for uh, how many years now? Probably four, 16 years. Um, I know rugby now. Rugby? But does that mean I can play it? No way. I'll die just seeing these big guys running towards me. I'll have a heart attack or a stroke or what, whatever comes first. Um, nothing different from mindfulness. You know, you can know a lot about it, but without practicing it, doesn't mean much. It's just a theoretical aspect. So the way it's been shown to develop mindfulness is actually through practice. So the most basic is actually learning to do mindfulness meditation. Um, boom. Lots of benefits. I won't go through the details of the benefits. Um, from cellular benefits to blood pressure, autonomic benefits to psychological benefits. But the interesting thing here in terms of us, us being doctors is it's been shown that when you induce mindfulness, there's less physician errors. Um, there's also in, in better immune response. An interesting thing which we did last summer, we did a study on medical students. 40 did a 10 minute, just a 10 minute mindfulness induction and the 10 minute, and the other group, 10 minute listening to a civil service type talk, which is the same, you know, both are, you know, can make you quite bored. Um, but the interesting thing is that uh, the, the medical students who did the, who were in the mindfulness group were actually more compassionate um, in, a, in, the, in our study paradigm. They were more willing to help the lab assistant. So a lot of things can happen when we're more mindful, we're more present, we're more aware of other people's needs and we feel quite balanced. Um, very relevant for, for doctors, I think. Um, no excuse anymore not to learn it. Um, there are iPhone apps. Um, the very, a very good app, which I just uh, downloaded a week ago, uh, is Headspace. Uh, registrar told me about it. Um, there's free online guided meditations, mindfulness meditation from our Calm website. There are local groups all over New Zealand, in fact, New Zealand's taken on mindfulness really well. Um, in Auckland, we have, we've organized retreats, one-day retreats for medical students. We had a one-day retreat for psychiatrists at Auckland District Health Board, and it was oversubscribed. I mean, people want to learn. It's nothing different from being, emotionally, from being physically fit. It's being emotionally fit. Um, there are MBSR courses in, in Middlemore Hospital. Apparently, it's required nowadays that junior doctors attend the eight-week mindfulness course. I'm not sure about requiring it, but that's what they did. But they are requiring junior... I actually, personally, I don't think I will want people to be required to do it because sometimes they become resentful. Um, but what's hap what I'm saying is it is being used now in different types of medical settings. Um, the, oops, how do I rewind? Oh, there's a small button. That one. 
this one, okay. So the second intervention is gratitude. It's one of my favorites, easiest, one of the easiest things to do. Um, some people call it a turbocharger of happiness course. In fact, one of the gratitude um, researchers, I, for, I forgot his name now, um, says that if you do the gratitude exercise for two months and you do not notice any improvement in your overall contentment or happiness scores, he said, I will eat a hat. I don't know why he said a hat. I would, but anyway, that's what he said. But um, I think it's over promising things. But looking at the studies, 70, 80% would notice improvement. And these are you know, randomized trials. Oh no, not randomized, but uh, separate. Uh, relatively well-designed trials, people getting gratitude and other interventions. Um, that there's a noticeable increase in happiness scores and contentment scores. It's actually a very popular intervention. Um, if, there's, if there's only one intervention you want to try, and the easiest, it's actually this. And you, in fact, some of my, uh, I have colleagues who do this gratitude exercise even in the dinner table with their kids. Uh, so this is one of the protocols. I mean, there's all sorts of, you can vary it. But the gratitude exercise, is, uh, an example, is the three good things exercise. And this has been, in, this, this has been studied properly. Um, very basic intervention or instruction. You just write three good things that happen daily. Um, in fact, I should, I should change this. Um, that happen daily for, it should go on for uh, the protocols now talk about six to eight weeks. So having a gratitude diary for six to eight weeks. And if you want to be more detailed, you can also write, you know, why are you grateful about it? What does it mean to you? Blah, blah, blah. I don't do number two. I only do number one. And I've been doing it since 2008. Um, unfortunately, I left my phone in my jacket there. And it's, now I use the iPhone to record you know, the things I can be grateful for. And the effects are interesting. Um, you start, well, I started noticing things that I don't normally notice. Remember, the mind is prone to negativity. We remember a lot of negative events more. Learning to develop an attitude of gratitude will just shift your perspective into a broader, you know, it's a broader landscape. So there's still negative things that will happen, but when you see positive things, they strike you. You remember them much more. Um, in fact, you know, re doing a quick read of my gratitude diary is like a mild antidepressant. In fact, I look a little psychotic because I'll start giggling and, because you know, I, I write all sorts of things there, including things I should not be writing. You know, I don't write about uh, patients' identities. I have codes for them. Uh, <laughs> and I'll say, Mrs. So-and-so, you know, found a job today. And I thought, you're talking about someone with schizophrenia. And for me, that's wow. And I had a patient yesterday, uh, two days ago, it's a hardcore homeless guy in Auckland who always wanted to have a home, but he's so psychotic, but now his psychosis is under control, and we found a house for him. And he's so excited. And he said, Tony, I just need three things. I need a bed, a fridge, and a television. He knows what he wants. Um, so we're uh, you know, mobilizing our resources. And for me, I write those things down. Because we forget, again, we forget all the little triumphs we had with our patients. And for some of you are, oops, who are surgeons, who save lives, remembering people who you've helped. Um, and it makes life a little easier. It's pretty basic. So for doctors, remembering at the end of the day the people we've helped. And you know, for some of you, you've helped so much. It's innumerable. Or people who, you know, not necessarily treat, I mean, we don't treat everyone. A lot, for, for many of our patients, we're just there, you know, ensuring their, you know, when they're suffering. But lessening their suffering and being present, that's priceless. But again, we get habituated. Remember why we did medicine. It's because of this. Not the rank, the rank's nice, the money's good, the intellectual stimulation is incredible, but for most of us, we did medicine because we want to help. But we forget this. 
we forget this. So it's a matter of just remembering. It's not that hard. That's why a lot of people like gratitude exercises. Easier than mindfulness. Mindfulness takes a lot of effort. This one's easy. If you can write a patient note, you can write a gratitude diary. Easy. Yep. Um, last, you know, well, second to the last intervention is actually developing and increasing empathy and compassion. I talked about this earlier as I think we are wired to connect. We are wired to help. It has been shown in animal studies as well. It has been shown in toddler studies, 18-month-old kids, um, an interesting paradigm where they, do, they actually help spontaneously. The paradigm's interesting. So they have an adult um, who accidentally drops a marker. And you see an 18-month-old spontaneously pick it up and give it back. So they don't get anything in return. They don't get a chocolate, nothing. And that's been shown um, in, it starts happening around 18 months. So if your kid's 18 months and still not showing this, no, just show it. <laughs> I'm a psychiatrist, I think of the worst. Um, but let's not talk about that, all right. So um, there's actually a difference between empathy and compassion, a, a minor difference. And probably I might be splitting hairs here, but empathy is when we recognize another person's uh, emotional state or situation. And recognition can be an emotional recognition, like I can feel that they're suffering, or it can be an intellectual recognition, I know she's sad, okay? And the part of the brain that fires up is the inferior parietal cortex. Compassion is actually a step further. Compassion is hopefully what we all of us have, is we recognize the suffering or their emotional state, and then we want to alleviate their suffering. Okay, so there's a desire to help, a conscious desire, not an automatic desire like, oh, okay, suture it, no. But there's a desire, a motivation to help. And the brain circuitry that fires up is totally different from empathy. Um, it's actually, uh, apparently the brain parts that are firing up are correlated with positive emotions. Whereas if you're only empathetic, you might burn out because empathy can be very negative. If you're surrounded by negativity and suffering and all you have is empathy, oh my God, you know, but you don't have that willingness to, or, or even motivation to improve their situation, you can get burned out. In fact, some people say that compassion fatigue is probably due to being too empathetic without actually being compa truly compassionate. But that's a complex situation, the whole, uh, concept of compassion fatigue. And interestingly, empathy, compassion, the desire to help is actually talked about in most, if not all, religious traditions. Okay? Um, if you want to be happy, practice compassion. In fact, the Dalai Lama always says this, you can never be happy if you're not compassionate, which suggests probably something to do with our circuitry that as social creatures, there's this incredible level of fulfillment. Our brain rewards us when we help because that helps the species, if you, if you look at it purely from that perspective. And I've mentioned this a few times now, it's apparently one of the highest and most sustainable forms, forms of happiness, and then if we're disconnected, it's the worst form of unhappiness. And oxytocin, I didn't mention oxytocin earlier, oxytocin is the sexy neurohormone being studied now. Um, apparently, it's responsible for this feeling of connection among other neurohormones. Um, we, are, we are having an oxytocin surge if I decide to hug Heinz. You know, if, he, if, he, if, he doesn't feel, if he doesn't feel threatened and you know, we really care for each other, we feel warm, um, oxytocin surging. Okay. But if, uh, if he recoils, then probably dopamine spikes for both of us, you know, it's excitement <laughs> or it's a war. Um, but it's a very powerful feeling. And like what I mentioned, even thinking of past be helpful behaviors can make you feel good. And as doctors who deal with a lot of people who are suffering, and we have helped so many of them, we sit on a gold mine of happiness if we think about it, just reflecting. We reflect always on the disasters, on the mistakes or other people's mistakes. We, we, we do, that's another, you know, we, we don't have time to talk about that. Jealousy, uh, envy, you know, the basis for that and why we do that. Um, interesting work 
if you want to look at this kind of uh, experiences from a primate perspective, look at an author. Uh, his name is Franz, F-R-A-N-S, Deval, D-E, and then W-A-A-L. He's, he's one of my most revered scientists. He's actually helped me understand human behaviors much more than Freud. Um, we'll we'll talk, talk about him a bit later. Uh, I, he's written a lot of good books talking about these things. Compassion, envy, politics, but from observation of primates. Okay. How can you develop genuine kindness? We can actually develop higher forms of, higher levels of, of, of empathy and connection. The most basic is to see others, so seeing the patient or seeing the nurse, seeing our colleagues as exactly like us. We just want the same thing. We just want to be happy. You know, we just want to avoid pain and suffering. And if you see a patient or some or your colleagues from that perspective, compassion flows. It's better than teaching bedside manners. Teaching bedside manners, we forget bedside manners when we're under stress. But if there's genuine connection, a lot of these things flow. Um, another thing which is, uh, this is a little too Eastern, in fact, um, among Tibetan Buddhists, their motto is not to go to heaven. Their motto is to be of highest benefit to all beings. So when they do their prayer wheels, it's more, you know, that everyone, that may, everyone be happy. But as doctors, you know, we can't we can do prayer wheels and all of those things. But I think one, one of the things we can do as doctors, and I do this once in a while if I remember it, is before I see a patient, particularly the difficult ones. The nice ones, compassion flows because they give us cakes and Christmas and wine. And you know, when you see them, oh, you're so, you know, how are you? And we genuinely care. But for the, you know, the evil ones, no, sorry, let's not talk about the evil ones. But for the, you know, um, um, compassion challenged ones, that's where we have to be conscious. So what I do, and this has been, you know, this is something I learned from Eastern practice, from actually from a Tibetan doctor. Um, before he sees a patient, he tells himself, may I be of benefit to this person? It just put things in perspective. We're not just here to, you know, to treat the cough, but we actually want to help a person. And I think it can change things. And when I see, you know, for some of you are psychiatrists, you know this, when I see my worst borderline patients, um, I already have a couple of breaths before I meet them in the waiting room. And then without them knowing, I already do a little, a little bit of compassion meditation in my head, like, you know, may, may, you, be, may you be happy eventually. And then when I see them, <laughs> you know, they're angry. Um, they don't know, but I'm actually partly mindful. I'm aware of my breath, because if not, my hands will be on their neck. Uh, <laughs> So, and knowing that they're suffering, being mindful that they're suffering, being mindful that I'm suffering as well, <laughs> changes the whole dynamics. And I have this very you know, short comments in my head, may we be both happy. <laughs> I am making joke of this, but it's, inter it's an interesting mental gymnastics. Okay, so keeping, on the, keeping the motivation alive for us as doctors. May we be of benefit. May we be of benefit. And probably we can't be of benefit all the time, but just the motivation. Um, and this is quickly, um, some of us are very hard on ourselves. So this is a picture. I'm, I'm not promoting the Philippines well, but in the Philippines around Easter time, we, uh, not we, uh, a few hundred Filipinos crucified themselves. Um, so a lot of self-beating. It's a religious thing. Um, but many of us, particularly Westerners, are very good in beating ourselves up psychologically. When we make a mistake, we, are, we, un, we do not forgive ourselves. When other people make mistakes, we can be very nice and compassionate, but when it comes to ourselves, we're very hard. So a lot of us lack self-compassion. And there's interesting work now that people who have low self-compassion have higher rates of anxiety, depression, as well as just being very unhappy. So we're doing some work now in the med school looking at self-compassion among med students, nurses, and doctors. Um, this is a website if you want to learn more about self-compassion.
Um, and I think I'll finish here. You can wake up now. Um, that's not my cat. My cat is cuter than this. <laughs> and I'm not sure if we have time for questions, Heinz. I'm over, you know, it's now tea time. And you want to be happy with tea? You know, that's, I mean, yeah. it's a, yeah. Yep. Thank you very, very much.